right back. All right, now let's discuss organic fertilizers. Yeah. All right, Simon, let's let's just start out with, you know, what's the difference? Yeah. You know, what's, what's the difference between salt-based and organics? Sure, I mean, like I mentioned about the salts, I mean, they are very convenient. Um, okay. And you're pretty much getting very consistent results time after time. With organics, you're accepting some variation. I mean, there's no question about it. You're also working with the natural environment, in this case, generally the soil, um, yeah, to get about, the most out of it. What about the source? The yeah. source material is, is yeah. very different, right? Yeah, it totally is. Uh, obviously, a, a salt-based fertilizer is going to be manufactured either in a lab or in some kind of industrial factory factory. Yep. Um, so, you know, there is that to keep in mind. With organics, what you're doing is you're taking things that are natural uh, and you're using them similar to what's been done for, well, at least 500 million years on this planet. And you're recycling those nutrients back into the soil around your plant structure. We're talking about manures. We're sure. talking about bones, bone meal, yeah. you know, just the, the natural things in nature that uh, that just would, would, would occur, you know. Sure. You know, bird droppings, animal droppings, yeah, for, you know, uh, for carcasses, myself, you know, breaking yeah. down into the soil, right? Totally. For us in BC, I mean, a lot of that was salmon. I mean, uh, even down into California, a lot of those big redwood forests really relied on that uh, that fish base to really grow as big as they did. Yeah. How does how does fish get from a river out into the forest? Yeah. And I've seen that firsthand with bears in my garden. Uh, you know, they're very good at moving that fish out and then they only eat certain pieces and then sure. other animals eat the rest. So, you know, this is where food chains actually become very important nutrient cyclers as well interesting yeah so yeah so the bears out there fishing in the stream yeah pulls this thing out takes it into the forest eats what he wants from it yep leaves the remainder that stuff starts to break down and just you know yep introduces that organic material yeah and when you're talking about forests I mean the fascinating thing is you can check the rings of trees to know just when there was a good salmon year um, so you know organics have really built the planet around us and gardeners have a really good opportunity to harness that energy and bring it into their own garden sure now we had mentioned how salt based fertilizers are immediately bioavailable to the plant yep. you know it's already uh, soluble um, but these organics oftentimes they're in solid forms yeah so I think that's a really good good point is there's a couple of different types of organics and I think it's a good time to really just emphasize uh, what I would think of as three. Okay. Um, so what you would have is there'd be granular organics and these are organics that are generally going to take a, a little bit longer to break down in, in the soil, really better for an outdoor gardener rather than indoors. Yeah. You're also going to have meals and powders and that's what a lot of people will be used to mixing into their soil prior to planting. Bone meal, a kelp yeah, powder. Yeah, or stuff a, like that. A yeah. kelp meal, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, something that a lot of people use is, you know, cottonseed meal as well. Like there's different things that you can use either plant-based or animal-based that are going to take a little bit of time to break down though. And this is the thing with a powder uh, as well as the granulars. You need to have biology present to get the impact on your plant. If you don't have biology, for instance, in an indoor garden um, where you're not adding biology, you're not going to get the effect from those uh, minerals coming out of that uh, organic material. Yeah, so because yeah, it's know. it's that biology, it's these it's these microorganisms, yeah. it's it's this bacteria and fungi that's effectively breaking down these organic materials yeah. and, and that's when they make it soluble to the yeah, plant, right? Correct. Yeah, so and bacteria are a great place to start because they are great at feeding. Um, and there's two ways they can release. One, they can release right away in mm -hmm. a bioavailable form. And also when they die, they're gonna release more minerals into the soil as well. Um, so How there's, and, yeah, and then you're gonna have things like the protozoa that'll come through like a lawnmower and just eat all the bacteria and the fungi are working around everything. It really becomes an infinitely complex system when you start considering organics and that's why the third option uh, in terms of an organic uh, especially for indoor gardeners mm -hmm. or growers that are used to a mineral fertilizer you can get what are called digested or fermented liquids okay. and what you're getting here is an organic product that's actually as available as a mineral or a salt based fertilizer and this is where things get really exciting because the problem in a container is you might not have the biology mm -hmm. and you might not have the right temperature or release curve for, to get those minerals out when you have an organic that's readily available for your plant you can dial your growing conditions into what you want and you're getting more of an impact from the liquid uh, just by itself without necessarily needing to involve biology although I would still strongly recommend trying to add biology as well interesting um, so could a liquid like that be used in a uh, in a water culture system yeah and if you're gonna go into a drain to waste system 
it's quite possible that you can use that. If you're in a recirculating system, mm -hmm. it's only for the adventurous. Gotcha. Uh, because in the recirculating system, you are gonna potentially run into problems with an oxygen drawdown if you get things living in the liquid. Um, you can also get some foaming in your reservoir and as things, again, are living in there. Mm -hmm. So generally, it's a good drain to waste option for a water system. Okay. And for people that are worried about, hey, wait a second, where is all that waste going? Again, we can put that right back into our garden, onto our lawn. There's all sorts of opportunity to take those minerals that are still available to plants mm -hmm. and use them on other plants. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you touched on three different types of organics. Yeah. We just covered on this, this more soluble, pre-soluble one. Sure. What would you call it again? Yeah, I mean, it, it, essentially it's a digested liquid or a fermented Dig liquid. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for instance, soy sauce is a fermented organic liquid sure. as well, okay. right? So, yep. I mean, just think of it that way. And in general, they actually will smell a little bit like a, a, a soy sauce base. Okay. Yeah. And so that type, uh, that type of organic in that form yeah. is probably best suited, again, for maybe a water culture type growing situation? For sure. But it's also good in greenhouses, in any kind of container, um, really even outdoors in true soil. Okay. Although true soil can take, um, you know, powdered and granular amendments much more effectively. So it's a very versatile Correct. Is what, is what I'm hearing from yeah. you then, as opposed yep. to the other forms of organics, maybe they come in the granular form like we mentioned, yeah. or even the more solid form. Yeah. Uh, when would those be applied? What's the, what's the best applications? Yeah. I mean, look, a granular those? could be applied uh, at any time during the season, but in general on all of these, you want them early in the season. Uh, okay. If you're outdoors, what I would really recommend is with a meal or a granular, you can also apply them in the fall of the previous season as well. And then you're going to get a real sort of opportunity for it to break down and get right into that soil-based system. Um, and for those that are concerned, don't worry if you don't have plants in the ground in the fall because what's going to happen is you will get some digestion mm -hmm. and then it's going to stop when it gets cooler as all the biology stops for the winter yep. and then restarts in the spring. Um, so you'll get this little sort of bump of nutrients, but then it's going to slow down again until it warms up. Sounds like a nice way to get a head start into the next season is to yeah. introduce some of these amendments, these organic amendments into your soil yeah. during the off time. Yeah, so in the fall, I really like to use a rock dust or a kelp. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a really because those take longer to break down in the soil, especially the rock dust. Yeah. And so it's important when you're using a granular or a meal type product in an organic range to consider what time of the year you're applying different things. So it sounds like, um you know, that fermented liquid yeah. might be a little more versatile, a little easier to use. Why would yeah. somebody choose to use a granular or solid organic as opposed to the, uh, yeah. the other form? Sure. And as an organic grower, I tend to use all three okay. um, for different reasons. Um, the reason why you'd want to use a granular or a meal is because you're going to get much higher organic content. Oh. Organic content, which is framed as organic matter is really what soil like all around us right now is full of organic matter. And so organic matter in your garden is very important. And a fermented liquid is going to be much lower in organic matter. We could be talking about, uh, you know, three or four times as much in a meal or a granular uh, as you would find in that liquid. So there's reasons for both. Sure. On the flip side of that though, for the fermented liquids, generally in the middle of summer, a plant can outstrip the nutrient release of the soil. So you can actually supercharge them by adding in that fermented liquid mid-season and really see a boost on production that way. Wow, interesting. So it sounds like maybe a combination is a, Absolutely. Is a good way to go. A little bit of everything is always the way to go with organics, for sure. <laughs> Far out. Yeah. Um, now, what about source? Yeah. You know, I imagine when you're talking about organics, you're talking about these, you know, whether it came from a fish or it came from this animal or wherever it came yeah. from, I imagine the source material could be important. Totally. And there's a couple of different reasons for something like that to be considered. Uh, one of them can be that, uh, you know, there's a problem with genetic contamination in the world now. Um, we have a lot of crops that actually are very good at giving you a solid meal, like cornmeal is actually a great fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But as everyone's aware now, uh, a lot of corn is actually grown with modifications to, you know, take herbicide or whatever it might be. The GMOs. Um, exactly. So what you want to do is you do want to look for a certified source on a lot of these things because okay. it's really important. Um, for a rock dust, it's going to be less important. I don't know anyone who genetically modifies a rock, but you know, for things like I said, corn, or I mentioned. Uh, cottonseed meal. Again, you want to find something that's verified in your local community or in your local state um, to make sure that uh, you can feel confident using that product. 
The and other, sorry. When you say a certified source, yeah. what do you mean by a certified source? How would somebody recognize? Yeah, you're you know, going to get a badge on, a, on the yeah. product? Is Generally, that's exactly how you're going to see it. Okay. Um, and different countries have different versions. Um, so it's really important to know the certifying body in your region and understand what it means when you get that stamp on a product. Um, you know, we're filming here in California. Yeah. CDFA has the OIM standard as their, you know, very high bar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a great thing to see on a product when you're considering using it. Aside from, you know, finding a good quality source, is there something people need to be aware of outside of maybe GMOs? Yeah. Yeah, something that a lot of gardeners, or uh, organic gardeners specifically, are unfamiliar with is they think that organics are going to be always the best choice. And while I generally would agree with that, yeah. people should always be looking at heavy metal content of any fertilizer they're using, especially on an accumulating plant like cannabis. Yeah. Um, all fertilizers are going to contain heavy metals. Uh, right. There's almost no way around that. But you can check... Um, um, all labels in the United States should have an EPA address on them and that'll show you exactly what the parts per million or parts per billion even are in that product. Now in my experience when it comes to heavy metals and organic uh, sources, um, the fish. You know, fish yeah. emulsions are one of the bigger culprits in my experience. Would you agree? Yeah, they can be. I mean, look, uh, I find that some kelp sources can be a little bit high in arsenic, um, okay. but definitely fish. I mean, look, the oceans are where everything flows to, right? And mm -hmm. fish ha end up having a problem sometimes with mercury. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where, you know, knowing your source and verifying based on the label address that's going to give you, you know, right, it'll send you right to the data sheet. Um, that's going to be a really important thing for people to consider because, to be honest, um, being organic still requires some investigation and making sure you're getting the cleanest crop you can. What I'm hearing from you, Simon, is that all organics are not necessarily created equal. That's true, yeah. <laughs> well, great. Um, you know, when we were talking again about salt-based fertilizers, yep. we mentioned flushing yeah. and how important it is you sure. know, to flush, especially if you recognize certain signs. Yep. What about with organics? Is that necessary? Yeah, I mean, it's always a lot harder with an organic to flush out, especially if you're using a slow release product. It really will release until the end. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using those fermented liquids, though, where you're actually boosting the amount uh, that's in the soil, you can really end up uh, with, a, with a buildup of nutrients at the end, just like you could in a, in a mineral fertilizer. So in the case of a container-grown plant, I would still recommend flushing at the end. Okay. Um, outdoors in soil, it's a lot more difficult to uh, you know flush uh, nutrients out of soil, sure. um, probably not really a consideration at that point but at the end of season and at harvest you can assess whether you've added too much or too little fertilizer by the quality of yield that you get yeah you know and I personally I look at I look at the plant I like to uh, in the final about three weeks of growth on my plants in my garden I just feed them pure water yeah okay I like to see a natural senescence of the plant a natural yellowing of the plant where sure. it's using up the last of those nutrients that it has yeah um, I find it just makes for a smoother smoke. Yeah, for sure. And if you have the opportunity, I mean, a lot of people outdoors right now are growing in very large containers. Um, that's a lot different than growing actually in true soil. Mm -hmm. um, so even in those larger containers, it's a great option. So plants actually have a nasty habit like we do as, as people. Um, and so if I go to a buffet for a month straight, I'm probably going to end up packing on a few pounds. Sure. And plants actually do the same thing because right. what they're thinking is at some point I might be nutrient starved. So they'll actually take up nutrients and push them into tissue unconverted. Now this causes a problem, especially on something that you're consuming um, from lettuce in the ground to cannabis, because now you've got unconverted fertilizer or minerals in your plant. So when you're flushing, even in an outdoor situation, what you're doing is you're helping the plant metabolize any excess minerals that have been caught up in its tissue. And so what you're actually getting is a cleaner product coming out of your garden, no matter what you're harvesting. Sure. Yeah. I've noticed sometimes, you know, you, you're smoking cannabis and if that ash is where I'll recognize some sort of nutrient buildup. If somebody yeah. didn't flush, it'll be this black charcoal ash. Sure. It's just kind of hard as opposed to a nice fluffy, you know, white ash. Yep. And I'm certain that's what it is. It's just yeah. the buildup of the, you know, the fertilizer. <laughs> sometimes you can there. even smell the fertilizer if, if people don't know what they're doing. So, wow. I mean, flushing out fertilizer is a really important part of uh, growing cannabis. There's no sure. question. 
Sure. Well, uh, is there anything else you'd like to mention about organics before we move on? Well, I think one interesting thing is that uh, one thing we haven't mentioned in, in either segment is the fact that organics and mineral fertilizers or salt-based fertilizers can actually be used together. Really? A lot of people think these are mutually exclusive clubs, sure. and it's just not true. Um, in fact, some of the best options for container-grown plants can actually be a blend of the two. Um, and so, give me an example. Yeah, how would somebody? How would somebody exactly. use both? So, um, something that we haven't touched on is, is chelation, um, and I'm sure we'll get to that to, at some point. But um, chelation is is when um, you know, a substance actually coats a mineral and makes it easier for the plant to absorb. Okay. In an organic circumstance, humic acid uh, is a very good chelation agent. And humic acid can be used with a chemical fertilizer to actually combine and make it better for the plant and easier to use. Um, so there's a really good example. Uh, a lot of companies also like to add kelp extracts into their final formula as well. Okay. And kelp has a variety of benefits that can actually supercharge those salt-based fertilizers as well. So there is that sort of middle ground and a lot of people actually are most comfortable in the middle. Um, you know, obviously for you and I, we like the organic garden the most, um, but it's important important to remember that there's different gardening techniques for different people. Now um, would somebody be purchasing these products separately? You kind of mentioned that some companies actually do you yeah. know, blend these. Yeah, no, in general you're going to find in a high quality fertilizer, yeah. uh, you are going to find a blend of organic and salt based fertilizers together. Um, obviously high quality fertilizers can be organic, pure as well, and you know, pure mineral as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a variety of options and really this is where your local store becomes a really good, um, you know, bellwether on what's going to be the right choice for your garden. All right. Well, excellent. Thanks so much, Simon. No problem. This, uh, this was highly uh, informative session we had here today, yeah. man. It's a pleasure. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us on this uh, discussion on salt-based versus organic fertilizers and we'll see you guys next time.